uh, to the room. So welcome everybody. Uh, this evening we're having a conversation with a pro. It's part of our series that we host uh, as we have a conversation with a pro in the writing community. This is an event hosted by Writers on Fire, which is a Nexus Generation community. My name is Nikki Tate, and today I will be chatting with author Karen Audio, who writes historical fiction and narrative nonfiction and animal stories, all for young readers. She grew up horse crazy in Nipigon and uh, in Ontario, and then majored in math and computer sciences at university. Karen's love of family history uh, and the tale of a Finnish silver spoon inspired her to begin writing for children. When she's not researching, writing, or working as a freelance editor, Karen enjoys canoeing, photographing wildlife, reading, and traveling. She delights in revealing nuggets of little known Canadian history and natural history in her presentation to studios and uh, to studios to students. <laughs> right now, Karen lives in uh, Kelowna in British Columbia. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me, Nikki. Hey, a pleasure and lovely to see you again. It has been a while since uh, we chatted, so it's great to see you here in the Zoom room. So I want to jump right in here and let's go back a little bit in time and uh, tell us a little bit about how long you have been writing and what drew you to historical subjects. Well, I've always been interested in writing, although uh, way, way back in my childhood, I much preferred illustrating my stories than writing them, but I had to write them in order to have something to illustrate. So I really thought that's where I would end up. I would be a children's book illustrator. Well, that didn't happen <laughs> because writing took over more of my uh, creative interest. And as far as getting into writing history, uh, going back to high school, we had to take a history course, and it was my least favorite course of all. And so how did I possibly get interested enough in history to want to write about it? It was through historical fiction, through reading historical novels. I remember, in particular, The Source by James Michener being one of, I mean, it's massive, but it's one of the early uh, historical novels I read. And to have that, to bring, in, bring all of those civilizations to life, it got me hooked. And then I think as I matured, I also paid more attention to my grandparents telling their immigration stories and, and coming to Canada as young adults and, and all, that, all that was involved. And that just really uh, sparked my interest in learning more about my family history and then turning that into, into a fictional. Uh, stories. So th that's a, a great segue, actually. So when you you had a choice between writing straight uh, history, nonfiction, and fiction, why is it that you decided to fictionalize history? I I guess my natural inclination is to uh, use story to convey history. And so my automatic uh, choice is, is fiction. In fact, with my Okanagan history book, which is a nonfiction book, it has a narrative nonfiction story component in the first half, then a timeline, then historical notes and photographs. But it's, it's that telling it through a story that makes most sense to me and and I think that's what engaged me in in learning history so I think that that will work best for readers. So this is tell us a little bit more about that particular project the where you're describing that as narrative uh sorry historical narrative it's non-fiction though right? Yes. Tell, tell us a little bit more about that book and that project. Sure uh so I was trying to look at 225 years of Okanagan history in and around Wild Horse Canyon and trying to pick out what would be of most interest to young readers. Uh, and so most of what's in that first part of the book in the story part is fact. However, there, there are some fictional components just to make it hold together. Uh, but then in the historical notes, it will elaborate all of the actual 
factual details. So you, you, you get confirmation of what's real and what is made up. Okay, so there's a definite distinction in that particular book. Um, yeah. when, when you are writing um, historical fic fiction, how do you convey to the reader which aspects are real and which are fictional? If there's real people mentioned in the story, I, I have never used them as a main character, so, uh, but I will include them in a list in the author's note. So I'll explain who is real and, and then basically everyone else is fictional uh, out of that list. Uh, we jumped, uh, you mentioned that you write for young people. Are all of your books for children? Yes, for varying ages. Um, so my picture book is for basically seven and up, chapter book seven and up. But then my historical novel trilogy is more eight, nine and up. Why did you choose to write for children? I think I haven't grown up inside. No. <laughs> um, um, my natural writing voice is about 11, 12 years old. And that, that's kind of where, where I mostly do my writing. Some of my more recent works are for even younger age. So maybe I'm going back in time here. Um, yeah, it just, it feels like the right voice. And so that's where I land. <laughs> okay, well, fair enough. Um, so when, when you're choosing to write about a particular historical event, uh, first of all, how do you choose your subject matter? History is vast and wide. So where, how, how do you get started? Where do you find your stories uh, from that big historical mass that you're, you're potentially dealing with? Right. Uh, most often it's a historical event or person in history who sparks my interest and I try to look for those li little known aspects of history so that uh, you know it's it's something that I can bring to readers and and um, that they haven't heard about before okay so when I was first thinking of writing uh, Second Watch my first novel way way back it was going to be a picture book about the Titanic because I was inspired by this silver sugar spoon that my grandmother's friend claimed had been saved from going down with the Titanic. But the more I thought about basing it on that ship, I thought there's just so many books written on that topic. Um, maybe, maybe I can take a different approach. Thankfully, it was my grandfather who, when I was asking other questions about the people associated with the spoon, he said, that was not the only ship that sank in that family's history. They also had family members on the Empress of Ireland ship that sank in the St. Lawrence River in 1914. And I, I didn't even know it was a Canadian ship. I thought it was an Irish ship. But no, it was a Canadian Pacific Railway ship. Um, and so that launched me into a whole different area of research. And I thought, this is, this is the topic I want to focus on because hardly anybody knows about it. <laughs> so fascinating. So you found a, a nugget of family history, went digging, and then that revealed this bigger historical picture. So I can imagine, so you began with asking questions of your family members, but yeah. beyond that, let's talk a little bit about that research process and what that looks like for you. How do you go about doing your research to make sure everything's accurate and, and is going to Makes sense within the context of your story. Sure, just, just to uh, tie directly into researching the Empress of Ireland ship to start with. I started looking into it in 1998. When I first did my, on, my first online search, there were only 300 hits. That's all. I mean, now you probably, I don't even know what it is now. It's probably half a million, <laughs> but <laughs> it was so little known. There was, I could read every website and every book written about it. And, and so uh, that was a gift in the sense because I, I knew that I was doing a comprehensive research. So, um, but as far as um, my kind of my approach to researching for historical fiction, I did gather a few images to share because I just think it's more interesting to, to look at something like that. So I'll share okay, my left screen. 
And certainly the first thing that one must do when um, setting out to write a historical piece, and I have to say, this is the fun part, doing the research. It's like time traveling for me, uh, going, digging deep. So if at all possible, uh, the best thing to do is to visit the location where your story is set. I was able to visit uh, Thunder Bay, which used to be Port Arthur and Fort William, and my, my novels are set in Port Arthur. And walking around the neighborhood where I imagine my characters living, there were still buildings there from 1914. So it was, it was really quite easy to imagine what the environment was like for my characters living there. And then I tried to find people who were old enough to remember the time period and, and that I could interview. And that is ideal. And of course, it's not always possible to do that. But if you can find people to, to ask what, you know, firsthand knowledge, it's, it's perfect. So, but also, um, I, I would study paintings and I would study, especially paintings because they would be in color and that would really help to under, you know, grasp the, the color palette of the time period, but, but also photographs such as um, this one that I found from 1913. Uh, the, the, my second book, Sarah's Passage, uh, it involved tuberculosis and tuberculosis was rampant at the time. So here you have the school nurse coming into the classroom doing a nose blowing drill. And so when I saw that, I thought, oh, of course, the school nurse has to come into my character Sarah's classroom and conduct a nose dr blowing drill. And so that was, uh, you know, inspiration for an actual scene in the, in the book. So, but also any, any primary sources, I try to go to those, any books written in the time, letters, journals. Uh, this is um, a journal by a, a child, I believe she was eight when she was on the Empress of Ireland on the fateful voyage when, during, uh, with the shipwreck. So to, to actually be able to read that primary document and get a sense of what, that, what was understood at the time, how uh, language was used and what was understood. Um, and then certainly newspapers. Newspapers written in the time period are uh, a treasure trove. And like, if you're fortunate, um, those newspapers will be digitized and available online. I mean, that's, that's the ideal. But uh, when I was researching my trilogy, I had to request the uh, microfilm from Ottawa to come to my local library here in Kelowna and then uh, sit, you know, make an appointment, sit at the machine, feed it in, read, read, and then take uh, photocopies from from there and then they got a new reader where you could bring a USB drive in and you could actually copy pages of the newspaper so that that made life so much simpler but they're they're golden like to, even to find the ads in newspapers like um, a public health ad in 1915 that was teaching people how to make their own masks. And again, this is against tuberculosis, but very relevant, um, except you wouldn't want to follow this advice now. It's not effective enough, but it was telling people to make so many layers of cheesecloth and fold them and tie string at the corners and tie them. And, you know, to know that that's what people would have done at that point was, was, um, again great knowledge to have and um, another ad I remember getting a eureka moment when I saw these ads for moving pictures called the girl detective and I was researching for my third novel sabotage where Sarah and her brother are you know trying to solve a mystery and so here she can go to uh, you know a couple of these moving pictures and and get inspiration for how to how to solve this mystery that she's facing in real life. And then there's priceless moments when you find a newspaper uh, a page like this front page from March of 1915 
Um, and this confirmed what I had heard growing up in Nipigon, that there had been spies planning to blow up the Nipigon River Bridge because that was the one link between Western and Eastern Canada for soldiers to, to travel across to get to, to France to fight in the war. And here's proof. So it was, it was again, that was a, a, a golden moment to get, get that. Um, what else do I use? Local history books, especially for uh, my Okanagan history book. The Okanagan Historical Society every year puts out a report full of articles and, and anecdotes and pioneers stories with photographs. And it's even indexed searchable index online. It's just, that was wonderful. <laughs> and then old maps and museums, uh, another excellent resource for, for searching out information. And um, this particular image, photograph, is of some artifacts from the Empress of Ireland steamship. And so when I go into a school and I show this, this picture to the students, I'll ask them, what, what do you think those round objects are? It's not the doorknobs. I know you know what those are, but what do you think those other round objects are? So um, what do you think, Nikki? Um, I'm going to say a light switch. Is that what oh, they are? You are absolutely right. They would be mounted on the, the cabin walls in the, on the ship. So oh, fantastic. well yeah, done. <laughs> so then other artifacts that would be really useful in your research are finding items like this. It's, an, it's a copy of an actual ticket used on the ship. So what information was needed from people and the size of the ticket. And then this one, which is a permit to leave Canada from 1918, uh, I think it is. Um, and it just raises so many questions. Why? Why did these people need a permit to leave Canada? And so those are, those are things that really help to spark questions and then more research. And what else did I use? Oh, lots of, oh, lots of online resources like timelines for food, timelines for furniture. Um, catalogs are so helpful. Most like when you're looking way back, of course, they're going to be black and white, but sometimes they'll tell you the choice of the colors of items, which is helpful. But for example, that rubber rattle that appears in Sarah's passage. I, I, modeled it right after that because I knew it was available then. <laughs> okay, one other piece of gold. <laughs> Sorry, I really love this stuff. So I'm going on and on here, but just a couple more things. The Henderson directory for cities in Canada, you can find um, a record like this and it lists all the businesses um, in, in, a, in the city and their location. And then has some of these ads, like at the top there, Port Arthur Steam Laundry, your laundry done promptly by white labor only. So this is from 1914. That was an important oh. thing for people to know. Ah, and every street address was either marked with vacant, if there was nothing built on it yet, or the name of the business, like beaten and aired blacksmiths, or the name of the resident, and their occupation, like Grano Dominic Grocer. Or it would just say foreigners. If the data collector couldn't communicate with the residents, that's how it would be reflected. So that helped me turn, you know, like, like it included every street address. So I could map out the neighborhood where my character lived, which is exactly what I did. I created my own map where all the important places that, um, that my character would visit are mapped out. So I have a sense how many blocks it is, how long it takes to walk there, what she would see along the way. Um, so yes, it was a lot of work, but it was fun too. <laughs> I, love, I love maps. So that's, um, that's just a few things that I love to uh, Those are fantastic to see and terrific examples. So as you mentioned, there are gold nuggets when you start digging and one question leads to another and so on. But tell me, have you ever got stuck? What's the most challenging thing you've ever tried to find out or had to research? 
Hmm. You know, I think the most challenging, and it, and it wasn't that I couldn't find information, but it was for Sarah's passage when I had to research um, the Toronto Sanatorium for tuberculosis patients in 1915. The most, because it was an emotional challenge, because my own grandmother had to uh, be sent there for many, many months. It wasn't until the 1930s, but it's still the same hospital, different name then, but, um, it, you know, and then to, to understand the layout and what was done, what kind of treatments were done, radical treatments in some cases, and to know just that emotional um, experience of, of picturing my grandmother there with very little English and being, you know, no family and being a thousand miles away from home, having left her infant daughter with their caregivers. That was the, that was the hardest, I would say. Well, that's so interesting. So it, it wasn't a technical thing at all, but rather an emotional connection through time. Were you able to bring some of that emotion into the storytelling? Absolutely. Um, and, you know, my, my grandmother never talked about her experience. She would only say it was a horrible time. Um, so by learning, doing that research, then I could um, then, uh, let me back up. It was 1993 and my, uh, when my grandmother passed away. And my mother was going through her papers and found letters that she had written to my mother as a, as a baby um, during that time when she was in the sanatorium. And so to be able to take those actual letters, even word for word, some of them, and include those as Sarah's Aunt Maria's letters home to her family, you just can't, can't get any better than that to have a person's actual words. Uh, so. Right. Wow. That, that is powerful. Um, I have a question for you. Obviously, you've got a deep passion and a love for the research process. When you're writing a novel like this, and, and these, this trilogy takes place over several years, it covers a lot of territory. How do you know when to stop researching? <laughs> yes, you do have to stop sometime. Um, and, and I don't find that easy to stop because I love it. But I think, I think the way to tell is is when you reach the point where you can clearly envision the environment and you can actually see your characters interacting within that environment. I think that's the time when you know you've done enough that you can write. And of course there's going to be a few more details that you'll need to research. But if you can if you can get into the writing and then just save that those bits of research for later. I know for I have to do that or otherwise who knows when I'll get back to the writing. I wondered about that. If it, so you don't necessarily have to do, you, you allow yourself that time and space to uh, fill in some minor details and tweaking later on after you're well yes. into the storytelling. Okay, so that actually brings me to the next question, which is how do you integrate or how do you go about combining all of that factual information with creating a compelling story, <laughs> realistic characters, all the stuff that goes into just a lovely novel. It, it is very challenging because when you love researching, you end up with files full of great juicy details that you just can't put them all in. If you try to put too much in, your novel becomes a textbook. So, so you really have to Stick with the story. What, what is most important to the story? What makes most sense? What's the natural thing to, to come about through that story? So, for example, in one of my books, I was writing about uh, Sarah going with her friend's family um, to the Dominion Day celebrations. So I found this wonderful article that had all the details of what would happen uh, at, the, at the day. I certainly couldn't include everything. So I had to pick like one event that would somehow trigger memories or images for Sarah of the shipwreck. And so that's what I decided to do. And it ended up being the greased pig, <laughs> um, what's it called? The greased pig event. So where, where all these men are 
chasing after this grease pig. But what happens in the end is the, the pig ends up over by the Port Arthur City Band's instruments and, and jumps into the euphoniums and, the, and this <laughs> and that and right through the, the, the bass drum lying on the ground. And that reminds her of the Salvation Army band members who were on the Empress of Ireland. So again, you have to work it into the story, but I just had to get greased pig and euphoniums in there. <laughs> well, there's a writing challenge to, to try to combine those two. I was curious how on earth you were going to get a greased pig linking back to the historical piece of this. So that's absolutely fascinating how, how you do that. And so you hold that um, or you maintain that process or follow that process all the way through the story from scene to scene to scene? Every scene needs, is that sort of your I, process? I, that's my goal. Okay. And my, my critique partners and my editors will call me out <laughs> on where things just, you no, know, no, I know you enjoy this bit of history, but it doesn't, it doesn't fit. So, <laughs> so you probably have quite a, a file of the leftovers, the pieces that <laughs> you weren't able to include, I uh, would imagine. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. So tell me, what, which part of the whole writing process, if you, from conception to all the way through, what, what, is, what do you enjoy the most? I guess it's no surprise that I love the research, but I also love, it's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle, taking those, those little bits of, of historical fact and piecing them together into the story. So the bit of detective work, the, the sleuthing of finding right. the, right, okay. Um, what about uh, the most challenging part of, of the process for you? Uh, sometimes it is letting go of the research phase and getting into the, just starting the writing. I think, I think first draft is the most daunting. Uh, once you have that draft, you know, there's always more you can revise. So I would say first draft. The first draft. Okay, fair enough. So you, how, much, how much research would you say that you do in the background before you actually begin that first draft? How much do you need to know before you get going? It depends on the, on the situation. Uh, like I wanted, for, for example, writing about the Empress of Ireland, I felt I needed to know, um, you know, not quite every detail, every rivet and bolt and everything, but I needed to know the layout of the ship. I needed to know about the crew and about um, you know what what what's involved with getting on board what the cabins like what what the schedule is what the rooms are like I, you know I, I had to have that clear picture um, so that I could position my characters there and have them live in that world did you have a map? It just out of curiosity, you mentioned maps and then all this detail about the ship. Did you have a ship's layout so that you sort of navigated your characters through the through oh, the hallways? Yes. yes, there's a, an amazing book called The Forgotten Empress, and it actually has fold out um, a whole ship ship map, like a, a schematic of the the different decks. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. So we know this is accurate. When you have uh, your characters running about through the ship, they actually were able to go where you said that. Yeah. That's very cool. <laughs> um, so are you, you've written a number of books um, and continue to write. Tell us a little bit about your writing routine. What, what does your typical day look like as a writer? <laughs> My best writing time is morning. So I do try to you know, work on that um, uh, for those hours. I'm most alert and <laughs> able to stay on track. Um, yeah, I guess I often will have multiple projects going on. So uh, I, I might certainly my preference is to spend hours and hours and hours on one, one project, but sometimes there's a deadline to meet in another. And so I have to break up my time. Um, Oh, I, I mean, I used, when I first started out writing, it was a chaotic mess. I did not have an outline. I just, I just imagined scenes and wrote them and I had no idea where they were going to fit in the book. And so um, I'm, I'll be forever grateful to Son and His Press for demanding an outline and, and for, the, for the, my proposal for my second book, because ever since then, I outline. I start with a sparse outline, then I get into um, details and get it as detailed 
as I think I need need to have it in order to to write, and then I write linearly right through the the outline. Oh, okay. And then what would you say there's an average number of drafts that you go through? How much editing do you do before it's handed over to the publisher and, and you begin to work with an editor? Oh, I would do at least three or four drafts myself before even sending it to my critique partners. And then it'd be several more drafts until I'm satisfied to, to submit it to my publisher. Then substantive edit, copy edit, um, so I'd say at least a dozen drafts. Mm, okay. And about how, for a novel, so for a juvenile novel, tell us about how many words would be in there and about how long one of those would take you to write from start to finish. <laughs> you know, Second Watch is my shortest, but it took me the longest because I was learning the whole process of constructing a novel for children and, and uh, getting it published. Um, I started that in 1998 with the research and it was published in 2005. But then I started working on Sarah's Passage soon after it was published and it was published in 2008. So radical difference there in mm -hmm. <laughs> shortening the time. And it was a longer novel. Uh, Second Watch I think was closer to 38,000 words, Sarah's Passage of uh, 45, sab Sabotage even longer at about 53,000 words. Okay. All right. And those just uh, for those not totally familiar with uh, children's books and novels, uh, the age group for that length and, uh, of novel would be about what? Who are you writing for? The first one uh, was aimed at eight and up. And then for the second, it was it was raised to nine or 10, I think, just because of the length. And certainly for sabotage it was kind of more 10 to 13. Ah, okay. So the audience actually aged along with the characters in the books. That's, that's, that's right. It. Yeah. And it certainly depends on the reading ability of the child I mean, and the right. interest level. Right. Okay. Um, what are you working on now? Those, those were some of your earlier books. What, what is your most recent project? Actually, well, what's your most recent book that's come out? Yeah, um, I just launched Kalan and the Stink Inc. last week, and it's a chapter book for uh, ages seven plus, and it's illustrated by Emma Pedersen. So it's uh, from the point of view of a wild BC sea otter. So off the coast of Vancouver Island, and he's young and weaned, and he's ready to explore the ocean. Um, but it's a scary place all on his own, and he finds some other young male sea otters to raft with, but they end up in trouble. They encounter Stink Ink, which is that uh, gunk, the color of octopus ink that smells horrible, and uh. they need help. So <laughs> that's my uh, most recent book that's just out there. And um, I, I'm just starting into the substantive edit tasks for my book that's coming out a year from now. And it's called Making Seeker, S-E-A-K-E-R. And it's a contemporary novel with a STEM theme. So science, technology, engineering, math. It's about uh, friends with, uh, you know, ch uh, friendship, and it's about uh, kids who have out of the ordinary interests. Oh, that's very cool. And I, are you drawing then on your own interest in, in computer science and mathematics? Yes, to some extent, yes. Yeah, awesome. Oh, that's terrific. I can't wait to read that one. So okay. what made you <laughs> shift from the historical and the quite, um, from that genre into more contemporary fiction? I have to blame a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was the, the librarian at the Nipigon Public Library who asked me if I would consider writing a picture book uh, for a story walk. <laughs> and so I, I got this idea for, for this, this book and I really, really tried hard to make it fit into a picture book. Well, everybody who read it said, no, no, it's going to be longer. Tried to make it a chapter book. No, your characters just have too much going on here. They, it has to be longer. So, yeah, I, when it was accepted for publication, it was more like 13,000 words, and now it's 24,000 <laughs> words. So, it's, I, think, yeah. I think that I, it's going to shrink some from there. But uh, that's, just, that's what the story demanded. So, yeah.
Yeah. Oh, <laughs> awesome. So that'll be out this time next year. It's a fall next, next year release. Awesome. Yeah, right. Okay. We will watch for that one. Uh, okay. We're going to jump into a fast round of some quickie questions and then we'll open it up for a quick Q and A for anyone who's watching who might have a question for you. Uh, so your favorite book about writing. For a long time now, it's been Jane Yolen's book, Take Joy. And it's a series of short essays about writing. And I, I alternate between laughing um, or just saying, you know, being encouraged or just understanding an aspect of writing that I hadn't before. So, yeah. Oh, cool. Haven't read that one, I must confess. So I'm going to go searching, add that to my list. All right. Um, are you a pen and paper person or a computer digital device writer? Mm. I used to write longhand in a notebook, but my, my wrists just can't handle that anymore. So I have an ergonomic keyboard so that I can work at the, at the computer. Okay. I still enough. will occasionally print something out, you know, if I, in order to read it aloud and, and see it on paper, because you, you just never see everything on screen that you do on paper. So, Yeah, so true. Um, your favorite author? Oh, that changes all the time. <laughs> um, okay, if we just limit it to historical fiction for adults, right now, I would say Kristen Hanna, and especially The Nightingale. I love that book. And for historical fiction for children, I would have to go with Julie Lawson because um, her books were mentor texts for me as I was learning to write historical novels. Right, as they were for many, I think. I, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, top tip for those days when you really don't feel like writing. If I get stuck and just can't do it, I, I get moving. I get outside and go for a walk or go cycling or go canoeing. Um, something that just takes me away, keeps me moving and lets my subconscious work on the plot issue or, or whatever is, is um, that I'm stuck on. Okay. And finally, what is the best way uh, for people to get in touch with you or to learn more about your books? My website would be the best place, um, karenaudio.com, and there's a way to email me through there. Uh, Lois is asking about the name of the street directory you used in your research. It's called the Henderson Directory, and either a library or a museum should have a copy of it. Okay, the Henderson Directory. And Carol's asking, how much research do you do in person? And how much is online? Oh, um, I would say for my historical novels, um, it's probably 25% in person and the rest online. For my Okanagan history, since I live right in the Okanagan, a lot of it was actually going, like hiking into Wild Horse Canyon or hiking along the Fur Brigade Trail and, and actually talking to historians one to, face to face or visiting museums. So. so let me ask you about that book. That was heavily illustrated, correct? Mm -hmm. So yes. tell me a little bit about that process, if you can. You didn't do the illustrations, but tell me about the research for the artwork that accompanied that story. Um, Lorraine Kemp did the illustrations. She's local Okanagan all her life, which was really helpful for her because she really knows the environment. So getting those details of sky and landscape. And of course, there's a lot of horses in the book. <laughs> and so and, and being a for her being a horse lover and a skilled artist of, of horses, it, it was very useful that way. Um, certainly, I shared all of my research files, photographs, and whatever with her so she could have those as a starting point. But we still together, um, you know, had to meet with different individuals, especially for the um, Indigenous component of the book. We had an advising editor, Jordan Coble, and both of us would go together and he would review her, her drawings and then her paintings. Um, and, you know, I would give feedback as well, 
um, you know, like just little details like the saddle blanket on a, on, uh, on the horse was the wrong color for the mm. time period for the fur, for the fur company. So, and those kind of things only by doing a ton of research, do you know, those things. So we were able to, it was a team effort to, to work together to get the, the research done so she could make those paintings as realistic and accurate as possible. So that's quite interesting. That's a little bit of a different process than is typical with a, a picture book where the illustrator and the author sometimes have no contact whatsoever. Uh, but in this case, you were able to work quite closely with Lorraine. Um, yes, that, yeah. the, the publisher requested that we, that we uh, approach it as a collaboration. And because we, we live with, within a few blocks of each other, it, it was so easy to do that. Oh, terrific. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Um, do we have any last questions here before we wrap up? Let's see anything else? Anything else, Karen, that you would like to throw in that we haven't covered um, that you would like to, to add on to the discussion here? I think one of the things that I also did when I was first starting out was I, I read a lot of uh, children's historical novels so that I'd get a sense of both um, the time period I was interested in writing about but also just how the novels were constructed and how history was conveyed in a, in a story format. So read, read, read. <laughs> read, 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 yes. It's always interesting to me people who say oh I'm not going to read in case I'm influenced and it's like hmm. You know, that's okay. Reading widely, both the good and the bad, I think is a wonderful way to get a feel for what's out there and where your work fits in the mix. All right. With all of that, thank you so much, Karen, for joining us to share a bit about your writing process. Thank you for you who uh, showed up here today. We will also make this recording available after the fact if you'd like to go back and catch any of the details or check out those amazing photographs and reference pieces that Sharon, uh, Karen shared with us. Uh, this interview with Karen Audio is part of a series hosted by Writers on Fire, which is an online writing group which is part of the Nexus Generation community. And for more information about that, either Writers on Fire or Nexus Generation, visit thenexusgeneration.net. All right. So thank you so much for everyone for joining us. And we'll see you again uh, next time. Take care, everybody.